Twas in the days of the revolution, dark days were they and drear, and by the Carolina firesides the women sat in fear. For the men were away at fighting, and sad was the news that came, that the battle was lost and the death list held many a loved one's name. When his heart sore that sat round the campfires, what ho, who'll volunteer? To carry a message to Sumter, a voice rang loud and clear. There was a sudden silence, but not a man replied. They knew too well of the peril of one who dared that ride. Out spoke then Emily Geiger, with a rich flush on her cheek. Give me the message to be sent. I am the one you seek. For I am a southern woman, and I'd rather do and dare than sit by a lonely fireside, my heart gnawed through with care. They gave her the precious missive, and on her own good steed, she rode away, mid the cheers of the men, upon her daring deed. And away through the lonely forest, steadily galloping on, she saw the sun sink low, and in the west go down. Halt, or I fire, on a sudden, a rifle clicked close by. Let you pass, not we, till we know you are no messenger or spy. She's a Whig, from her face I will wager, swore the officer of the day, to the guardhouse and send for a woman to search her without delay. No time did she lose in bewailing as the bolt creaked in the lock. She quickly drew the precious note that was hidden in her frock, and she read it through with hurried care then ate it piece by piece, and calmly sat her down to wait till time should bring release. They brought her out in a little and set her on her steed with many a rude apology for this discourteous deed. On and on through the forest black, the good horse panting strains, till the sentry's challenge, who comes there, tells that the end she gains. Ere an hour in the camp of Sumter, there was hurrying to and fro. Saddle and mount, saddle and mount, the bugles shrilly blow. Forward trot, and the long ranks wheel, and into the darkness glides. Long shall the British rue that march, and Emily Geiger's ride. Hello, my name is David Brinkman. We are at the Casey Historical Museum today to interview John Howell about his history and preservation work around the Revolutionary War heroine, Emily Geiger. John and I met about eight years ago when I became involved in locating, through archaeology, the colonial town of Granby and Fort Congaree too, right here in Casey. John has a wealth of knowledge about Lexington County history, and this was very helpful in our work. A few years after I met John, DNA testing linked me to the first tavern owner in Granby and Columbia. I am the first cousin seven times removed of this tavern operator. This was quite a surprise, as I had always thought I was the first person in my family to be born in South Carolina. John's family history, on the other hand, was very South Carolina rich, and included people from the backcountry settlement of Saxgotha first settlement back country in South Carolina. It turned out that John was also related to this first area tavern owner. So after years of local history discussions and work, John and I learned that we were cousins. Before long, John informed me that we were both related to Emily Geiger. Of course, this was an inspiration to figure out the exact genealogy line of Emily but I quickly hit a dead end, as it seemed Emily's father had been erased from the books. Today, John will be talking about his history work and give a possible explanation to the mystery of Emily's father and unveil to you the final resting place of Emily, which has been lost for many years. Well, here we are today at the Casey Historical Museum, and I have John Howe with me today, and um, John is as you will soon learn, has done a lot of research on Emily Geiger. Some people pronounce it Geiger. Um, I've been trying to force myself to do Geiger, but um, 
Either way works. Neither or neither is okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So we, we've got a few questions, John, and you can kind of act, go on from these, um, but we just want to cover some things. We've got some other pieces, um, the video that will come in during this, after this, and in the editing phase. So, so first of all, John, could, could you just tell us, how did you first hear about Emily Geiger? Let me say first, it's an honor to be here with you, David. I, I met you in fine and Granby, and I'm, I'm telling you, I've been around a long time. I haven't seen your equal as far as knowledge on research, putting things together, and this good common sense. So it's an honor to work with you. Well, well thank you, John, and it's been a pleasure working with you these years. But my first knowledge of Emily Geiger was in junior high school, um, the, the teacher taught us out of the Sims, uh, History of South Carolina, and it was like a page and a half on Emily. Well, I was 13 years old, and it stuck in my mind. And later on, I got into history, interested in South Carolina history and genealogy. Uh, she came back into my mind, and I was always amazed at the Giggers. I called them Gigger. When I was in school, the Gigger said, We're Giggers, not Geigers. So I stayed with Gigger. But it seemed like none of the Giggers knew who her, her parents were. And I couldn't understand why Generals Green and Sumter did not have her in the records, military records, or either their personal writing. So I went to work, I wanted to find answers to these questions. And then of course they asked Sally back in the 20s and 30s. He spent the last year of his life trying to prove she did not exist. He made very statements that I won't say stupid, but they were stupid. Like, if she lived, why come there aren't records and archives? Well, because she died in her 20s. She was not in any will. She didn't own any property. And there was, there was no record of her. Her, day, her parents didn't have a will. So anyway, I started researching her and couldn't find anything in archives. And by the way, Sally is of our kinship. You know, he was the first uh, state historian. So throughout my research, um, I uncovered that the only possible solution is about the general not mentioning her is that their egos would not allow a teenage girl to come in and get any of their pie. You know, she should there be any pie at that time, no one knew who was going to war. So that was the only conclusion I could come up with. And we even had it today. Even in a Confederate war, you'll only see officers mentioned. You won't see, very seldom you see a private or, or it's always officers. So I came to that conclusion and that satisfied me. So then, why do they talk about Emmons' famous ride but not her parents? Well, I found uh, there were so many John Giggers uh, that came over with Hans. Hans in Germany is John. John here. Must have been four or five of them. So then I found out that she lived off the Broad River. And I said, well, that might simplify things because I don't believe there are many Giggers up there. So I went to work and found a John Gigger living in the Broad River where he got property up there. And his brother Herman got property. So, uh, but then I found something I wasn't looking for. I found, I ran into the Weberite murders. And I found that uh, John Gigger a John Gigger was convicted and sentenced to be hung on the three murders that were committed. Mm -hmm. And they sent all of them, there was, I think, three or four people. Uh, Jacob Weaver was the head uh, guy, he claimed to be Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, they sent him to Charles to be, to be hanged. And uh, the Governor William Bull said, I think we should just hang the leader, and the rest of them are just poor, hardworking people. We're going to let them, we're going to pardon, he pardoned them. I would have hanged Jacob Weaver. And, and that John Geeger did, that date range would fit him. Would fit him, time. and then let me tell you what else I found. Um, that was, now, whether there were five John Geegers and I couldn't, all of them showed up at one, mm -hmm. I don't know, but then I find out that John Geeger's wife, husband died, Jacob. And Jacob Weber married. 
So that made John Giger and Jacob Giger and step brother in law or something like that. Oh, uh, so. And uh, so that was another clue that uh, there was a relationship there. And uh, so just just like the uh, cemetery, you know, that's, it's like, you might call it circumstantial, but it was a close relationship between Jacob Weber and uh, John Giger. And uh, anyway, he, they didn't hang him. Uh, some records say they, they told the rest of them to leave South Carolina. Some say they did, some say they didn't. But in the meantime, uh, Emily was born in 1763, and her father had married for the second time, Emily Murph, uh, which is my ancestor's uh, family. And uh, that's how she came about. She being much younger than uh, John, and John was old, kind of old people. Uh, but so that's how I came about that. And uh, then I said, well, in those days, even today, but Really, in those days, they were, the morals were so much stricter and all that the folks didn't tell the children about the scandal, but they would talk about the endless ride. Uh, and after several generations, uh, the family, the parents were, were out. Decades ago, historian Clayton Cleckley wrote a piece on the Weberite heresy. Cleckley was chairman of the Lexington County Museum Commission when the museum was first established. He was later a strong force behind the creation of the Casey Historical Museum. Quoting Clayton about the Weberites, a very strange sect known as the Weberites arose among the German-speaking people in Saxe-Gotha and Lower Dutch Fork, South Carolina, in 1756 to 1761. This cult originated along the Saluda River in the neighborhood of Younginers Ferry. Its area of local influence extended from Little Mountain to the confluence of Broad and Saluda Rivers. The sect originated with Jacob Weber, who was born in Switzerland and was raised and educated in the Reformed Church. He came to South Carolina at the age of 14 with a brother. Weber prospered early in life as a local planner but the death of his brother caused him to question his religion and the state of his own soul. In May of 1756, inner excitement reached a climax in his soul-searching experiences. Weber shared his religious enthusiasm with his neighbors by inviting them in for Sunday hymn and singings and readings from sermon books. He was encouraged by the response he received and those meetings seemed to be beneficial. Gradually, the participants began to admire the reader, which in turn caused him to admire himself. The more recognition he received, the more esteem he had for his talents. During the peaceful years of 1758 and 1759, this bizarre sect caused no problem in the settlements. It became evident that the Cherokee War had made deep impressions and caused strain among the followers of Jacob Weber. Saxe-Gotha and the Dutch Fork did not escape the Indian raids. Cherokee parties penetrated their forests and emerged to scalp, murder, and burn. The grave dislocations and terror of the Cherokee War diluted these early settlements. The ravages of Indian warfare hung over the German and Swiss settlements of Saxe-Gotha and Dutch Fork by spring of 1760. The people in this locality were without schools, while this caused little concern before the Cherokee War, the lack of instruction was sorely felt as the population increased. The spiritual condition of the settlers was most deplorable as the self-appointed ministers usually wandered into the settlements only a few times a year. The Church of England was the official church at the time, but it was not accepted by the German-speaking inhabitants of the area. After a season of depression and the ending of the Cherokee War, Jacob Weber became obsessed with the idea that he was the deity. He began to put aside the teachings of the Bible and preach out of his own spirit. Jacob Weber won over two co-workers who desired to be no less important in the meetings of the cult. They too professed most extraordinary revelations and helped to promote the sect. Meanwhile, the three leaders adjusted their differences by agreeing that Jacob Weber should represent and act like God the Father. Peter Schmidt was Jesus. 
and a third person, Mr. Dauber, a godless black preacher, was the Holy Spirit. These three leaders of the sect claimed to be the Holy Trinity. It was said that Peter Schmidt was a co-founder of the sect. Jacob Weber's wife, Hannah, was declared the Virgin Mary. With this organization, the sect grew stronger and stronger and practiced the most atrocious blasphemies. This religious disorder swept through the German and Swiss settlements. The sect gained so much momentum that neighbors joined it because they feared for the safety of their lives. Jacob Weber was determined that unconverted members must be healed through his efforts. Groups of both sects went about unclothed and naked and practiced outrageous atrocities. In their religious rites, they often fell into trances. They sanctioned nudity and marital confusion. The Reverend Christian Theus lived near the Congarese and endeavored to serve that area in Saxe-Gotha for over 50 years beginning in 1739. Learning of the activities of the Weberites, he came unexpectedly into their midst, finding Jacob Weber contending that he was the deity and that the unconverted members must be healed through him. Because Pastor Theus opposed their blasphemy, he enraged the Weberite leaders. They threatened his life pausing only to decide whether he should be drowned or hanged. Apparently, only the intervention of a kind-hearted Negro enabled Theos to escape. Finally, the three Weberite leaders began quarreling amongst themselves. Jacob Weber and Peter Schmidt disagreed with the third man, Mr. Dauber, who represented himself as the Holy Spirit. Weber and Schmidt agreed that Dauber was not properly exercising the office of the Spirit, and that he was neither hot or cold, but only lukewarm. They placed a mattress on the bottom of a pit, threw Dauber in, and piled more mattresses and pillows on him. Members of the sect leaped in upon Dauber and trampled him until he suffocated. The corpse was then taken out of bed and thrown into a burning pile of wood to be consumed to ashes. Soon afterward, Weber quarreled with Schmidt, the son. He declared Peter Schmidt to be Satan in disguise and ordered him chained to a tree. The band surrounded Schmidt, struck him with their fist, and beat him until he fell to the ground. Finally, they danced around him and trampled upon his throat until he was dead. These atrocious murders were committed on February 23rd and 24th in 1761. Charleston authorities learned of these murders by the Weberites, and soon the whole province was shocked by the crimes. After another murder in February of 1761, the leading members of the sect were brought to Charlestown for trial. Jacob Weber, his wife Hannah Weber, John Geiger, the possible father of Emily Geiger, and Jacob Burghardt were tried in Charleston and condemned to death. Jacob Weber was convicted and hung in April of 1761, but the others were pardoned by Lieutenant Governor William Bull. Yeah, we have the same thing in our family. Uh, some of the first that came over to Connecticut, and there was something really bad that happened to the man, and he was executed for it. And um, it was a, it, it's a well-documented case. I think it's pretty funny, but other family members don't think it's funny yeah. at all. Yeah. They should just um, look the other way. I always wanted the truth, you know. Right. I, mean, I might not speak it, speak about it later or whatever, but I want to know the truth. Oh, right. I don't want to know everything. I just want to know what I don't know, <laughs> <laughs> which is everything. <laughs> so that kind of uh, you know put me on the course, and then in the meantime, I discovered my ancestor John Murph, who was Emily's uh, uncle. Uh -huh. He's my fourth great grandfather. He was killed at the Battle of Capiens, and I believe he is also your right. I believe so. That's right. So Dave and I did connect DNA wise a couple of years ago. Yep, that's right. You know, we know. We've been looking at it, trying to find a connection yeah. since. And that's what got me interested yeah. in Emily when, when you pointed out that connection also. And then my friend Archie Moore, uh, he and I talk about a lot of history and things. So. I started talking about the Three Wit Cemetery. I said, I'd always heard it right behind the house. 
Well, it's seven tenths of a mile behind the house. And the old man identified two plowed fields between the house and the cemetery where Emily's buried. So Arch and I got together and along with my son Eric and Dean Williams, we, we started working, looking for the grave. We decided we would uh, mark as many as we could and bring forth any stones that were under the ground and all that. So Archie knew where the cemetery was. He'd been down there. So you know, he and I went down, and uh, that's my first time at the cemetery. And uh, Joe's being loved through which was the only stone showing and laying flat on the ground. Uh, and then I stumbled across that 1916 letter, state newspaper, and uh, the old man pinpointed two yards north is her grave. Then he said, east of her grave is her husband, but I haven't. Looked that, yeah, they would find that. So this was in the state newspaper in 1960. There's several of them, and I have, if you want to look at some of them, I have copies of them here. Okay. Okay. And uh, again, uh, you know, if, you, if you're going down the road looking for something, sometimes you have to get off that path. Right. You know, like you're getting off on a murk, and, uh -huh. and then me stumbling on the Weberite situation, and Lincoln, right. that John Ginger, Ginger, why he was uh -huh. not spoke of. Uh -huh too much, uh -huh. and then of course his wife, she had to take blame too. Uh -huh. But uh, you did a wonderful job on the uh, Weberite uh, story. And we will include that. that in that's the video. Yeah. Um, so you, um, so the state newspaper kind of puts you right into that area, then how did you actually physically pinpoint it to narrow it down? To the great to the grave of Emily. Uh -huh. Well, the old gentleman, now he was in his 80s in 1916 which would have put him being born in the 1830s, not too far removed from Emily. Uh -huh. I mean, had she lived a normal life, she'd have been alive in 1830, uh -huh. but she died young. So his parents probably knew her parents, and maybe even knew her. Uh -huh. So uh, he'd say he lived on a property all his life. Uh -huh. and, uh, so he, yeah, people back then just did not make up stuff. Uh -huh. And he was, he was upset because no one marked the grave. He said, at least put down a temporary marker. Uh -huh. Well, right now I got a temporary marker down, but thanks to Pamela uh, Griffin Hansen, she is going to donate a regular stone marker. And we're working on that right now. Okay. So uh, I had to believe the old gentleman, and then when I, when, when I followed the instruction, I found this grave with my dowsing rods. And that's, that's right. bringing some chuckles from the people out there. I realize that. Yeah. But uh, after finding the grave where the old gentleman said it was, then we called in the GPR people. G GPR. Uh -huh. Ground penetrating Ground radar. Ground radar. radar. And they went there and identified what I had found as a grave. Uh -huh. Now they, they used photographs. And uh, when, they, when I heard that, I went and heard about down there. And uh, not only did they find that grave, but to the west of it, right beside her, is a child's grave. Well, I knew she had a child that died early childhood. Uh -huh. Didn't get to know the name. Uh -huh. So I went back down my dad rod and they said, yeah, the GPR is right. Uh -huh. <laughs> no, okay. And uh, I'd like to say that uh, I never have believed much in, in the GPR, but I grew up knowing that uh, the early people found whale water with this stick, they call them witching sticks. Mm -hmm. So, um, and of course, as, as we talked about, John, you know, there's this thing called quantum mechanics which explains a lot of these mysterious things that uh, science, classical mm -hmm. science, cannot explain. And, and you know, if it can't be explained by classical science, they tend to throw it out. Yeah. Say that's silly nonsense, but um, it's now, we're beginning to learn more about it, and the dowsing rod is, is actually a, a possibility. Yeah. With that. Well, that was enough for me. Now, on, my, on the markers, there's no absolute. And I say the, this, this location is per a 1916 newspaper article. So I'm not telling people it's an absolute. Right. There's no way you can prove an absolute uh, on that cemetery. Right. There's nothing, nothing there. Okay. So all the markers say that the only markers uh, that I can identify okay. say that. You know, so. And I know, so, so you've taken some big steps, you and Pamela, to preserve, mark the site. And I believe there's also something planned in April. Next year. Uh, April, uh, April uh, the, the DAR is happening. 
and also as they are, they actually going to, we're going to have a barrel service family. I've already got a minister lined up that's going to preach the funeral. And the VAR, uh, they'll, they'll offer a color guard and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if they'll have other activities because our barrel service is not going to last 30, 40 minutes. Uh -huh. And there's really nothing we can do uh -huh. to make anything interesting uh -huh. other than her grave. Uh -huh. You know, so uh, yes. uh, hopefully they, they will volunteer to set up displays and maybe a camp or something because we've got about a three acre field that we can do that in and uh, have some activities or maybe a small reenactment or something like that. I'd love to see the ladies with the black morning dresses, the hoops dresses, you know, because I attended a Confederate barrel and it was something to see them out walking around the cemetery. So right now we don't know exactly what we're going to have, but the, the, the SAR has agreed to help us on this. Okay, great. So we're, going, we're looking forward to that. I right. felt like April would be a good time. Hopefully, this uh, virus will be yeah. a thing of the past. Yeah, we hope we hope so. Okay. And and um, and you know a little bit about this table that's behind you. Yeah, John. Uh, Could you tell us something about that. Yeah, um, this table was donated, and I, I bagged their groceries when I was in high school. Margaret Gager Ford. She lived across the road from her father. His name was White Ford. His house is still standing, and it's a mobile home park, but his house is still standing. Uh -huh. They bricked it up. Uh -huh. But uh, she donated, donated that table to the museum. Now, I don't know whether it went to the State Museum, and y'all borrowed from the State Museum. I don't know which museum, but she did. It, state yeah, Museum had it. Okay. So the State yeah. Museum, and they put it where it should be. Yeah. Uh -huh. But uh, she donated that table. And then I think, well, who is Margaret for? Because I bad grocers, but I thought, well, you know, that's somebody that really knows what she's talking about. Uh -huh. well, then I, and best research her, uh -huh. I find that she comes from the Merv Geiger. Uh -huh. So this actually belonged to Emily Geiger? Yeah. Geiger, when That's she what she said. And she, she had it at home. Uh -huh. And uh, they were known throughout Casey because they had a peacock. They must have had 20 peacocks and they were loose. Uh -huh. They just flew all over the place and <laughs> get run over out on the street and all that. Uh -huh. But she <laughs> said that was, and I believe her because uh, I traced her back to the and I was hoping the museum would get that table dated because uh, it looks too good uh -huh. to be from 1770. Uh -huh. no, uh -huh. okay. But uh, okay. maybe you can identify a little more of that. But I was, okay. I was hoping that you could get that, get okay. this dated. Okay. Right. But uh, this was uh, supposedly Emily. Yes, belonged to Emily Gigger Three Wheel. Uh, and this is an invitation to her yeah, wedding. Here. Yeah, and that's bringing a lot of uh, opposition. Uh, they, cl uh, they claim that the paper is old, not old, and they claim that the uh, a regular ballpoint pen wrote, they wrote a note there. <laughs> you know, so uh, don't take much faith in that. No. And the Calhoun County Museum's got the same thing, and uh, but they didn't. I mean, they kind of think it's real. But, but uh, I, I don't know about that. Uh -huh. Say 50 50 50. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, uh, but anybody that have that, you would think they'd have more information than what's out there on the Emily. We were told that that is a copy of the original one. So, but it is a copy, but that oh. there was an original oh, there is a document. Copy. So that's what it looked like. That, yes. Well, now online uh, in the twenties, a group of ladies visited uh, Mrs. Patrick over in Columbia, and she had the original. So John, what, what about Emily's house where she lived um, during her married years? Going back to the 1916 newspaper article, the same old gentleman, uh -huh. after he described it, Emily's grave, he said, now, see that walnut tree over there? He said, that was where Emily house stood and she spent her entire wedded life. Well, again, that told me that she never lived in a two-story house that's standing today. And we know she died young. Uh -huh. So uh, he also described the cemetery as being on the slope of the hill. He said at the very top of the hill was where the house stood. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's the little hill when we were we taking it. pictures of the cemetery. But there was a, it has trees growing on. But there was a building on it, uh -huh. and we weren't sure who owned the building, so we didn't try to meditate. Building. So now we're trying to find the owner of that building uh -huh. and get permission to meditate around the building, hopefully finding some 
uh, indication of a house. Yeah, or something from that. But that may not be enough for some people, but that was enough for me. Uh -huh. and Two-story house that's there that they considered Emily's house. She never did in there. Well, they considered John Threewood's house, and uh -huh. he's supposed to be the husband. Uh huh. But Mike Beadnaw, do y'all know who Mike is? Yes. He, you know he runs the South Carolina Preservation Office, right. and uh, he he uh, he has dated houses. And uh, he said, first of all, you wouldn't build a house like that with a Revolutionary War bond. You uh -huh. either build it before or after. Uh huh. Because the British have got those matches, uh huh, or Flintstones, I should say. So uh, he said it was built at the close of the war or prior to 1800. Mm -hmm. And I felt like it was built after. Now, the museum director in Lexington, J.R., tells me that he thinks it was built in 1830 by William Gigger, not John Threwitz, but the old maps show it as John Threwitz property. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. okay. So uh, by her living her entire wedding life on the hill, as the old man said, now he wouldn't have said that if she'd have moved. He wouldn't have said her wedding life. That's where she spent her wedding life. He wouldn't have said that if she moved. Uh -huh. and we know she died young, gave a job birth. They call it bed fever back then, bed mm -hmm. fever. Mm -hmm. okay. So uh, mm -hmm. that told me she never made it to the house. And then after the Revolutionary War, John Threewitz was a captain in the war under his father. His father was killed in the war. But he was a captain, and after the war, they promoted him, probably in the militia to major. Uh -huh. And he got into, he was a state senator and become wealthy, you know. And uh, that's when you become wealthy, that's when you build a house like that, you know. So, so I believe they started out in the other house, and then when they died, he remarried and got wealthy after the war. Uh, we're in touch now with a private owner to try to save that old house. It's a historical house, whether she lived there or not. Revolutionary War, major. Right. in the house, and it was a state legislature. And, uh, uh -huh. We're trying to say that we're in, we're in communication now with the owner of the property, uh -huh. and so far it's been uh, uh, positive. Okay, so but, I mean, we don't know uh -huh. whether it's going to be positive enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But uh, uh, yeah. we're trying to say that, and then I, I would love to see a historical marker there right. on Highway 176 yeah. for at the house. Uh -huh. And uh, the cemetery and the uh, her original house is, is you know off the beaten path, right. so there's no traffic going by there. Uh -huh. But it'd be nice to have it uh, positioned yeah. GPS wise and uh, uh -huh. on the marker, uh -huh. you know, uh -huh. west of here, parking so and so, uh -huh. and all that. Uh -huh. 176 was known as Highway Two and also the Old Stage Road. That's amazing. And I used to think the old stage road and the state road were the same. The old Charleston road, the stagecoach road were the same, but they weren't. And the old map showed a road going on the other side of Three Wits' house. 
uh, the entrance to Three Wits House today is the back of the house. Yeah. So, but an old map showed a road going in front in front of the house, which was probably the uh, junction from uh, what we know today, 176 Old State Road that came around and connected to the stage road uh, that right. went into Columbia. Uh -huh. yeah. But that's another point we should have mentioned. Where the Giga Cemetery is, uh -huh. that was where Emma spent the night after the British released her. So she spent the night at her uncle's. Okay. Now, her uncle, it was really her first cousin, uh -huh. but her first cousin married her mother's sister, which made him her uncle and first cousin. <laughs> That's where she spent the night. So, now this is the this is not the three wits speaker cemetery, but the one on the down, the other a yeah, little further one down. down on the east, old east from property. Okay. And before she began her ride, she spent the night. She spent the night there, and then started her ride in the morning. Well, she was delivering a message to Sumter. Right, that's what I mean. So she spent the night there because she didn't, she, she wanted to throw them off. Two oh. officers escorted her there. Gotcha. Uh -huh. okay. So yeah. the next morning, she crossed the uh, Congaree and delivered a message. But her original plan was to cross on Friday Ferry. But from Friday Ferry, you can see Fort Granby. Uh -huh. So yeah. she wasn't about to go back to Fort Granby uh -huh. across the ferry after she told them she was going to her uncle's house. Yeah. But listen to this now, the next ferry was Howell's Ferry, okay. but not Mount Howell's. Okay. Okay. The next ferry okay. was Howell's Ferry, and that's where she crossed. Uh -huh. okay. And then I'm finding out, coming on the beginning of her ride, when she crossed the Sluder River, that was Kennerly Ferry, yeah. which is a Tom Corley Road uh -huh. next to the new high school, uh, between the high school yeah. and Mount Zion Church. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That's where she, and she actually came down. Yeah, really yeah, school, yeah. 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 And she actually came down Tom Collar Road. Is it Tom Collar Road? Carly Mill Road. Carly Mill Road. Mill Road. Mill Road. She crossed what is day three seven eight and got on Lee Park Road. Uh -huh. And from Lee Park Road and the junction of the old Barnwell Road, now it becomes the, the old Cherokee Path. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So that's that was a direct shot yeah. into uh -huh. the uh -huh. Grand. Uh -huh. So that was her. That's best we can tell. That's her route. Okay. How about that? So we could actually do a, uh, you know, yeah, tour. Make a map. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that would be mm -hmm. pretty neat. But she crossed on Kenneth Ferry. Later, Kenneth Ferry turned into be Lark's Ferry. And, uh -huh. and Lark's house is still standing, Samuel Lark. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And uh, <laughs> Samuel Lark's uh, ferry operator was a gigger. Uh -huh. uh, and, then, and then he married a gigger. Uh -huh. So uh, all kind of connections. Uh -huh. The many, many giggers throughout the state, but many states in California, what well, is that California County? Election count. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yes, a very interesting family, and I've never met one that I didn't think highly of, and I met a lot of them. They're just a good family, and that's why I don't believe there were many stories told about right. Emily or made up stuff, you know. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. If there's anything made up, it's probably somebody that might have got involved with that. I don't know. <laughs> but I don't think a, a good gigger would have done that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's interesting when you can tie your family in with the historical. Right. Right, well, yes, that's a big motivation to, yeah. to do a lot of things. Yeah. But I'm not going to go into Emma's grave to get DNA to see if you and I okay. can turn. <laughs> 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 we'll let that dog sleep. Okay, <laughs> maybe one day. Somebody <laughs> suggested that. Somebody suggested that. Mm -hmm. yep. see, see if you can get some DNA and yes. no, no, yeah. yeah. When we got in there digging, I mean, call it digging, I said, we're not digging. We're not going to dig in their grave. We're going we're gonna to try to locate stones. Uh -huh. Probe the stone and bring it up, not trying to get in anybody's grave. Right. Right. Yeah. That's really good. Yeah. And that's what that's what's so amazing about any kind of research. When you find something that proves something uh -huh. that you can think about, uh, uh -huh. probably happen. Uh -huh. And it's just amazing how things do fall into place when you get into it and have an open mind. Yeah. Don't get hung up on something as an absolute. Uh -huh. You know, be uh -huh. ready to back up. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. You know? <laughs> And uh, my little research, I didn't do it every day, but uh, it goes back on her probably 15 years. Uh -huh. you know, every now and then I'd get on it, you know, so uh -huh. I didn't do 15 years of research, uh -huh. but I did research over 15 yeah. years. Yeah. Sure. Alexander Bell's wife, granddaughter, wrote, and a lot of them got notarized statements on them and things mm -hmm. like that. Okay. And said that uh, she remembered her uh, grandmother talking about her spending the night there um, and the many times and then uh, Emily would tell them about her uh, later on in life oh, about, about the ride, ride and, really? and all that. Oh,
So there's so many things that uh, add up, you know, and then, then you got to sift through some different versions. Yeah. And we don't know how we don't know how important that ride was. Oh, right. I mean, yeah. you know, um, yeah, that's it. I can leave here today and tell somebody I ran down those steps, and I'd be lying. <laughs> but, but sometimes things exaggerated, you know. And uh, but uh, I, you know, I think what she did, she did deliver a message. Mm -hmm. And now they're they're claiming also that uh, that message led up with uh, Francis Mayer, and General Green, and uh, Sumter to meet at uh, Utah Springs. Utah Springs for the battle. And then that was the last big battle of fall. Right after that, Cornwallis left South Carolina and uh, mm -hmm. surrender to Yorktown. Yeah. Uh, John, I want to thank you for the great interview and all your work you've done on Emily, um, researching and the preservation you've set into motion here. And, um, and we just want to wish you the best here at continuing, as there can probably be some more things done here, Hopefully. especially like drawing out Emily's path. Hopefully, but I appreciate you bringing all this forward. Perhaps some other people might enjoy yeah. it, and okay. maybe, hopefully, one day we'll get involved and carry it further. Yeah. Okay. But it's a privilege to work with you because okay. you, you really know so. many things. I haven't figured out all the things you know yet. You know a lot more than me. I'm going to shake your hand, even though we're yeah. in the virus age, and I suppose. <laughs> okay. Thank all you right. very much, John. Okay. Thank you. And we need to be and, sure. okay. You know, uh, David, the granite marker is down there, too. Yeah. Um, probably a little younger than our model here, oh. and we actually have some um, some lithographs or some prints from the. These look like more like 18th century or early 19th century prints, oh. uh, showing the ride. And there's Emily sitting upstairs in Lord Ralden's bedroom, getting ready to eat <laughs> the uh, the information she has. So. Mm -hmm. So this so, is Emily's room. Okay. Yeah. With the discovery of Emily Geiger's grave, John Howell may go down in history as having made the first significant archaeological discovery using quantum mechanics. After the interview, John challenged Odessa and I to use his dousing rods in an old African-American cemetery that is next to the Casey Museum. My previous experience with these rods produced inconclusive results at the Three Wits Geiger Cemetery. This time I focused most of my attention at keeping the rod handles exactly perpendicular to the ground as I walked across the known grave. To my surprise, the rods rotated inward as I crossed the first grave and then rotated back after the grave was cleared. That's the grave there. <laughs> what is it? What is it catching? What is it getting? We don't know. It's, it's science doesn't understand. It. Let me do it. Odess took the rods and started walking in what appeared to be an unmarked yeah, area of the cemetery. Them, them the rods crossed unexpectedly, but we would later find there, a grave foot marker okay, at this location. Forward and Look, got something happening there. I then took the rods again and crossed two more graves. The same phenomenon occurred. Ha! Huh. That's the one. Yep. Now it's actually going to flip around this way. Go over here. I'm not on level ground here, though. I don't
You got it. Okay. Odess also made another successful test. Watch out for those ants there. Turn. Okay. There. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> See, when, when Mike Viedenbaugh dated that two-story house, he said, close it a war. Oh, my goodness, excuse me. It's all right. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to cut it off. <laughs> old clip. I, I always do that. Could have happened to my do that. video camera, too. <laughs> I, I, I know better, because when I go to the doctor's office, I do the same thing.